You're going to see it come on up here. It's actually probably already on. It's great. He likes to fool with us. Marky Mark. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we should be on in a second there. Oh, he actually did it. Really nice. Stuff. He must like you because he actually usually screws around with me. But here we go. Let's record on the cloud. That's the voice from above. We don't like to mess with her. Hey, everybody. Guess what? It's uh, it's Wednesday. So that must mean it's time for Whiskey Wednesday. What's that? Gone Wild. I should say. I should. Thank you for pointing that out. Gone Wild. Because uh, tonight we have, um, we're going to do a very different, I got to make sure that this is coming through. We're going to have a very different uh, Whiskey Wednesday. Uh, we're going to do tequila tonight. But I do have a, a, a special guest tonight. Taylor Gregor. That's right. Did I say that right? Okay. I want to make sure I get it right. Cause. Thank you. It's going to talk to us tonight. Really? It, we're going to, we're going to taste tequila tonight. And we're going to talk about, about your, your Cape Horn tequila veteran made sailor approved. I sure that'll sort of give us a little bit of a clue, Hell yeah. but this is, but this is really sort of like it's, it's two, it's, it's two birds, one stone. Using the tequila, using uh, what we saw, um, Ash Fact, I'm going to put that up there. So if people want to see it, um, let's see if I can get that over there because uh, I'm going to put a link over there so everybody can sort of see what we just saw here. Um, and I'll put it on on the Facebook page and I'll get uh, Cousin Vinny to to do something else with it later. But I'll put it up on the Facebook page so you can you can see that. Um, yes. Yeah, so it's we just saw the clip. We saw what was that? Basically, a trailer. That's a trailer for the film. Yeah, you can you can see the whole thing online. You can rent it anywhere, but it's uh, it's free on Amazon Prime. And what's the name of the what's the name of it? It's Say called it again. It's called Hell or High Seas. Okay. And this is out of your. There's a on the the sheets in front of you. There's a uh, QR code to the documentary. Yeah, you can get you can get it on here too. But this is out of this this sort of starts with your your journey. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a hard hitting. You, you, you were in the military, you, 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 you get out, you have PS, PSD and you, this is sort of your journey through that. Do, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Why, why sailing? Why, why this, this cool, it, it's it, in a lot of ways, is a crazy like adventure mm. that puts you at total risk of losing everything to, but it's it's that process of gaining everything back yeah. at the same time yeah we can jump into it it's, it's certainly worth talking about um hell or Seas tells our entire origin story it tells you why we make tequila and why we do what we do um it really sums it all up in a nice 90 minute package um <laughs> edited for you know for television yeah, we had, I mean, we had a good production team. None of us were filmmakers um, on that film, just FYI. So no Steven Spielberg, Spielberg's on our boat. Thank it's, you, sir. It's saying cut. Yeah. <laughs> Let's redo that scene, reset the ocean. Yeah. That, we need that to do that happen. all over again. As far as Cape Horn's concerned, I don't recommend going down there. It's not, it's not, none of it's fun. There's not a fun moment down there. It's cold. The average wave height down there is 70 feet. Um, yeah, it's not. It's not fun. I probably won't do it again unless uh, we do it on a right boat. That boat you'll see in the film is uh, way too small and has too many holes to be in an ocean like that. So, I, but even even I'm just gonna I just want to jump on this a little bit. Even in the filming of this, you guys are all you know you're you're struggling to get through this, and that's the whole sort of metaphor. But you're struggling to get through this. Get around Cape Horn, but you have and, and we lose sight of that when I think when we watch a lot of things, you don't realize there's also a, like a film crew there doing this, like filming this. How many guys did you have that were doing the filming too? Uh, we didn't. We didn't have a film crew. What, what was it? Just set cameras? Yeah, we had rigged GoPros on the boat. Wow. Um, I would fly a drone every now and then whenever the winds would allow it. Um, we did have a, a film crew, our production team, the guys that made that film. Um, they met us down in Ushuaia down on the bottom of the world uh, to just film us around Cape okay. Horn and um, in Patagonia. And then we had some pickup shops in Chile, but all of the sailing scenes was just Steven, John and I filming. There wasn't, we didn't have a film team. The boat was not big enough. It was barely yeah, big I know, enough. That's what I'm looking people. at the boat and I'm like, <laughs> how are they getting all these people on this boat? Mm -hmm. The fact that you even made it all the way around in that size of a boat 
seems sort of amazing to me anyways. Godsend for sure. But the whole, and we're going to get into the tequila and we probably should, we're going to get into that. But this was sort of the catalyst for doing the tequila. This was the catalyst of bringing other veterans um, involved in a program that you saw that that was needed. Mm -hmm. And you were explaining to me a little bit earlier, explain to me like the sort of the three levels of the program that you actually do for, for, for veterans. Cool. Yeah. So the, um, man, there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, I know. I, I gave you a too broad of a question, um, but like, okay. So, um, how does, how does a veteran get involved with doing, uh, with becoming part of the sailing program? Veterans usually find us through the film and I'll say 90% of the people that, that send us an email, we get about three emails a day from either a wife or a parent or a husband of somebody that's still active duty in the email. Um, 98% of the time says my husband or my wife or my son, they're not doing well. We just watched your film. Do you have any advice for us? Can mm -hmm. they come out and sail with you? And uh, that's, that's how people find us. And when that happens, um, we have three programs they go through. We have an inshore sailing program. We have a coastal sailing program. We have an offshore sailing program. Yeah, I mean, you just like, because I think we were talking about this before, you just sort of can't jump into, right? if you've never sailed before, you sort of can't just jump in. You go like, even if you look at this and go like, oh, I could go out, I could sail on the open sea. And then you get there and then I can't do this. Now you got to take, how do you take them? You can't take them back. You're stuck. You're stuck on this. So you you sort of like set up these things. So this is sort of your um your your trials to get to that place where you're going out in the open ocean. Yeah, yeah. Um, we got in a, we when we first started the nonprofit, we were bringing everyone offshore, and that <laughs> almost got me killed a couple of times. Um, because some people get offshore and realize they don't like being offshore and they want to get back to land really fast. Um, and then that makes it a problem for everyone else on the boat. Um, I'll say not a lot of healing happens whenever you've got somebody freaking out on board. Yeah. So the whole mission kind of shifts to taking care of that one person. So um, it, it's kind of developed over the last two years. We've been doing this um, skeletal crew, our nonprofit since 2016. So eight, eight years now. Okay. So um, it really started two years. This is, this is, one of the first years I'll say it's kind of gone fluidly uh, when people reach out to us. That was the worst thing you could have said. <laughs> <laughs> You're a sailor. You know yeah. better than that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, they, they'll, we'll bring them on our coastal program to see if they actually like sailing first. And, um, you know, I'll be the first one to say that as far as um, healing. So we, what we do is it, it's called adventure therapy, which is essentially group therapy at sea. We can get into how that kind of heals your brain on a physical level later if we have time. For okay. Um, it's pretty in depth. But um, it's group therapy at sea where you're working in your endorphins and adrenaline and running. It's been shown to regrow areas of your brain that shrunk whenever you're in the military and you think you're going to die consistently on a daily basis. That's what we do. Um, so a coastal sail doesn't do that. They need to. You need to be in an environment where it's sustained. Um, you're working really hard. And, and and adrenaline and endorphins are running. That's that's one of the key component components of regrowing areas of the hippocampus. I, I would say that only happens when you're offshore for three or four days. So the the uh, inshore sailing doesn't really do that. It's not really enough time to actually heal. Um, but you got to make sure that they're you gotta ready to do this. Yeah. So so if people like being offshore, then we'll do the coastal program, and um, that's where we we sail from Galveston to Tampa, Tampa to Key West, and Key West to Charleston, and then up the East Coast. Right now, uh, we have a boat that's in Annapolis that's going to sail to Portsmouth um, here soon. So each leg of those will bring eight to nine veterans at a time. And then once they've gone through some coastal sail with us, we'll sail offshore. Um, just recently, two months ago, we just got back from Cape Town, South Africa. So we sailed from South Africa to Brazil, to Trinidad, then to Bermuda, and then to Annapolis. Um, and each and, leg, and each leg is like you, you take on new crew, basically, mm -hmm. yep. and you switch it up. Each one of those legs was about a week and a half to two weeks long. Yep. Okay. And then they're getting sort of that whole experience over like a two week period. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a sailor, so I'm going to, I'm going to apologize. I cuss sometimes, but it's, it's just, it's group therapy at sea where you get your ass kicked. I mean, that's the best way I could describe it. To people. Um, I'm just going to point this out. We actually have the record for most swearing. Oh, right. this program. Good. And uh, it comes from a friend of mine. She's probably about five feet tall. If, if that uh, four, four, 
nine or ten, I would say, and you don't even stand a chance. Okay. Well, <laughs> she curses is worse than a sailor. I could actually say that now. <laughs> so don't worry about it. Um, um, the only thing you'll have to worry about is uh, Zuckerberg will uh, will uh, uh, silence you on on the uh, on the interwebs. But that's about it. Other than that, say what you need to say. Does that happen to you guys often? It seems like a thing. <laughs> about what? About Zuckerberg finding y'all in show. Oh, no, no. It's out of a joke. It's out of an inside joke because sometimes things work and sometimes they don't. Yeah. And he seems to be the computer god that lets it happen. We're on we're on Facebook Live right now. Gotcha. So it's not going to happen. Cape Corn Tequila, uh, Cape Corn Tequila is actually watching us. So there you go. Hey, well, are interested. Hey, there you right. go. Cruise, cruise, cruise. Um all right, so that sort of brings us into what we're going to actually taste tonight. Mm -hmm. So now you've come up with Cape Horn tequila, veteran-made, sailor-approved. Tell us how you sort of got into the the sort of the tequila thing. And it, I mean, for me, it looks like it's a, a it's a really cool way to eventually, and I know how hard it is to build a brand, but eventually help fund these programs that you want to do for the veterans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this, this tequila, our tequila, Cape Horn tequila, the only reason it exists is to fund the nonprofit. Um, so hundred percent of the profits go directly to our nonprofit. Um, that's, that's, that's why it's here. It's called Cape Horn because we got the idea when we were sailing around Cape Horn, it's in the film. If you needed a drink, you said, yeah, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, that too. <laughs> but, great. um, one of the many instances where we thought we were going to die down there and it was the one thing there's a conversation you have with your friends when you're about to die. You're like, man, what if we don't die? You know, what are you going to do? And, um, the guys you'll see on the film, Steven, um, was writing a book. It's called from the land of Genesis. And it's actually incredible. I think it's one of the best books written on really showing people what it's like to reintegrate the civilian society after being deployed for three or four times overseas. I'd recommend it. If, we, if there's any readers in the room, um, John was, was going to finish getting his captain's license and, and work for a, a captain teaching school and open his own shop one day, which I think he's doing now. And um, I wanted to start something to keep funding our expeditions or nonprofit. Um, that was a problem for us. It came, it became a problem several times where, you know, we'd have donors that would just ghost us that promised to buy flights for guys out to the boat or fly them home or supply food for the boat. It was a real issue and it put us in a bad spot because it's like, we're at sea right now. We need, we needed that, you know, we could really use that help that, that you promised. And, um, I was like, I don't ever want to be in this position again. I want to create something that makes sure anybody else that sails with a nonprofit doesn't have to worry about a single thing because you don't need that kind of stress around. So you, right. should, you should focus on yourself and, and focus on healing. Um, so I decided to make a, a tequila when I was down there and yeah, I didn't, I mean, I didn't have, really anything going for me at this point. I mean, it's part, part of the reason why I went to Cape Horn too, is because at this point in my life, you got to keep in mind, again, I don't recommend going down there. It's super dangerous. It's not fun. It's cold. <laughs> it's really cold. <laughs> Make it sound so inviting. Um, but I didn't have, I had, I had broken everything at my life in my life and anybody that loved me or um, cared about me, I, I, I broke them. I broke that entirely. I didn't have anything in the world to come back to. So when I made it back alive there, I went to Mexico and, um, you know, just kind of, just kind of moved around and, and worked down there for a while. Finally, um, found agave and there's kind of this, this underground scene in Mexico that, that isn't really talked about in the States that not a lot of people know about, but everybody that's been down there, it's pretty clear real, Real tequila doesn't really exist in the States. And that's because agave takes good agave, genuine agave takes nine years to grow and houses keep that agave within families down there. So you don't really get nine year old agave because mass produced distilleries are only buying four or five year old agave to keep up with production. production so yeah. I kind of fell in, I kind of fell in love with that. I was like, there's this little underground competition between centuries old families growing these agaves down there and uh they know not to bring it to the states because we're just going to put it in a margarita i was like this is awesome man i, I, I want to be a part of this and uh you know i'm just some some white dude down there trying to buy agave which is not going to happen um so yeah just i worked down there for a couple months on a farm finally um found a farm that that grew really really good nine-year-old agave and there's there's some good tricks i learned down there that i'm excited to show you guys tonight that 
uh, not, I haven't met a single person that has known it yet. Um, so whenever we can start tasting these, I'll, I'll walk. Well, that. yeah, they'll have, they'll, we'll, we'll have a mutiny on our hands uh, if we don't get to start tasting this using a sailor term anyway. Right. Cool. Can so I go ahead and go through a little quick trick? Or you can do whatever you want, man. It's all, it's all I'm taking the floor. All right, guys, you got it. You guys have earned that Blanco after watching that trailer. So um, before you drink it, I, ju I just want you to try this. So real there's, we, we're going to get into this too, I hope. Okay. Um, so additive additive free is like a buzzword with a lot of tequilas right mm -hmm. now. Right now, there isn't a real regulation. There isn't a regulatory body that that goes through the process of distilling. <laughs> there isn't a, a reputable regulatory yeah, that's, body. That's, that's, that's fair really the big thing. I mean, do you, you remember whenever they tried to, uh, the CRT came out with it. it was, I think it was like three months ago and CRT shut it down. Yeah, down. And they tried to, yep. Make, yeah. Um, I think it was a raid. <laughs> I think there was a raid involved, actually. There's, uh -huh. there's a lot of money behind that. So the only real way to see if if a tequila is additive free is to put it on your skin. And with that, you can tell if there's any additives. If there's additives for flavor or color, it's going to turn sticky or tacky. And it's going to kind of feel gritty in your hand. But real, the most important bit that I have, I have these autistic tendencies, right? And uh, one of one of like my massive obsessions in the world is is lying. And I hate that anyone can write 100 percent Blue Weber agave mm -hmm. on a bottle and you only need to use 51 percent agave. That's just really fact. a mix out. Yep. Well, a mix though is anything less than 51 percent. Right. 51 percent. So you can use 51 percent Blue Weber agave, 49 percent white sugar and still be called 100 percent Blue Weber agave tequila. And so the biggest thing you can do is the first thing I do, we would do on the farm anywhere is, is I dip my finger in a tequila and then I rub it on my skin just like this. And real tequila, 100% agave genuinely doesn't evaporate from your hand, kind of like aloe vera. So if you like put Patron on your hand, it would evaporate like vodka and it would feel sticky on your hand. Real tequila should feel like aloe vera and not evaporate. So it's, it's the very first thing I do. Does that mean? Uh, yeah, that's you're going to go here. up front now. No, that's a, we've got to unplug this. They're coming it's, for me, man. I'm by... breaking out all the secrets, dude. <laughs> um, yeah, it's the best. It's the first the thing. The rallies do. are, gonna, are knocking at the door. And even when it dries, it shouldn't, it shouldn't feel sticky. It should feel like residual lotion on your skin. That's that there's no sugar in that. There's no additives. That's what real tequila is supposed to do. Yeah. So, if you feel any type of tackiness, mm -hmm. Then don't, there's something don't else. You're don't gonna drink. get a you're gonna get a hangover. My my other thing is I, I'm fond of saying is if your tequila tastes like birthday cake, you need a new tequila. Yeah, don't drink it, man. That's what I tell people all the time. I'm like, if you're drinking something that makes you want to throw up, you probably shouldn't be drinking it. It's probably not good. <laughs> that's bad. It's not that's not real tequila. Real tequila, um, in itself, the best way I describe it to people that that haven't experienced real tequila before, and by real tequila, I'm talking about hundred percent agave, no nothing in it, like real nine year old. That's all that's in there. That's what I mean by real tequila. Um, the way it's distilled is exactly like mead. Think like honey. The consistency of honey and agave are very similar. Like you can even supplement honey for agave juice you buy at the store, like the little squeeze bottles. It's the same concept. So real tequila is closer to a mead than it is a spirit like a vodka or a Patron or whatever. Um, it shouldn't have that burn. You should be able to sip on it just like a mead. That's 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 a real tequila. Um, so right. that's a little trick. You're, you guys are welcome to to try out the Blanco if you'd like. I like the nose on this one. It's, it's really nice. Yeah, the Blanco is great. Listen, nice. if you and that's the other part of this, too. Like if you if you're with a tequila house and you there's a couple of exceptions to this. But as a general rule, if you can't make a good Blanco, none of the exactly. other tequilas are going to be good. 100 percent. You can't you can't change it. You can't change this part, which is the Blanco part. Well, you now, this, if you put additives. In well, it. Yeah, well yeah. yeah. Yes. We're, yeah. we're trying to stay away from that, though. <laughs> good. Good. Yeah, there's that's a, really good. You get that freshness. You almost start tasting like salt and lime almost immediately. You get that green, like uh, almost like a bell pepper sort of flavor to it. Mm -hmm. yeah, but it finishes off really nice. And it's got a, if you notice even on this one, it's got a longer finish and you get a warm feeling. You don't get a burn. Yeah, that's a good that's a good thing to look for. Like the longer it stays on your palate, you know, it shouldn't love you and leave you. Tequila's there to stay. If it does, it's the ethanol, it's white sugar. Um, that's that's I mean that there's no other way to say it than that's what it's supposed to be like. And I keep saying it like we're the, we're like the best tequila in the world. I, I tell people we're we're really not. We're really we're not the best tequila in Mexico. I, I know plenty of tequilas in Mexico that are better than ours. 
but in the States, there's maybe two or three that are real tequilas um, that are like that, that, that don't burn. And you're like, oh, you know, as I like to say, it's, it, it uh, stokes the fire, but doesn't choke the chimney. That's a good, that's a good saying, man. So you're full of these. Walmart. Yeah. You ready? <laughs> Hang, hang on, we're in for a ride. <laughs> I like it. I'm drinking tequila. Hang on, we're in for a ride. No. I like that one. No, it's really good. I like this one a lot. And, uh, you know, like I said before, it's really important. I noticed you, I noticed, I know you got like everything, all the nom and stuff. So people can look up the nom and they can see where it's from. Mm. Um, and it's even kosher. Um, but you got all the stuff in, all the stuff in, and it's a hundred percent, you know, Listen, you're in Mexico. You can put almost anything you want on it, yep. and it doesn't mean it necessarily is. It, you're basically trusting the person that makes the tequila or it's in charge of the brand, which is you, yep. um, to make sure that these things are all right there. Uh, that are all right there. What do you guys think? You like this one? All right. Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's clean. It's 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 clean got a lot. Word. It's clean. It's got a really good taste. You know. I, I, all right. You ever have Fiji water? Oh yeah. Okay. You know that that like wet. It, it's a weird thing. But you know, like it like when you drink like uh, certain waters, uh, Icelandic uh, glacial water. I find the same thing. You feel a, a you. It's almost a coolness or a wetness on your on your palate. Like it's a, it's something else regular than just regular water. I find this with the finish on this. You sort of get like a a cooling factor after you've drunk this too in your mouth, which I think is really cool. I like it. Thanks, man. It's all about the nautical miles we sail. I like that too. The proof Maybe. is in the pudding. No, it's, yeah. it's right here. Maybe. No, uh, it's this is the 700 mil. I should point that out. Uh, it's 80 proof. All right. The whole thing, I, I like, listen, I don't drink the bottle, I drink what's in it, but it's got pretty cool bottles too. I mean, it doesn't hurt that it's pleasing. Thank and you. it's, and, it, and, you know, I usually tell people to go, go in more stuff that, because more women buy stuff than guys do. That's a fact. And, but but it, this is this is um, just enough rugged, <laughs> just enough rugged with the skull and everything on it. Just enough rugged that you really have to sort of look at it to catch it. Other than that, you go like, "Oh, we're going sailing today. That's great." <laughs> but really nice. That's cool. I like it. All right. So again, like I said before, you cannot you cannot make anything better than what you can make in a Blanco. You can't correct it. You can age it, but if you're starting with junk, you're going to end up with junk no matter what you sort of do, unless you're going to add, yeah, you know, nice. listen, the fla as I told you before, the flavoring companies have to stay. In that's right. Too, yeah. Right. There's a lot of, so truth there. there's a lot of, there's a lot of truth to that in the industry. And that's what you're going to see a lot of people trying to clean that up over the next couple of years. You've already seen it starting, but you're going to see more and more of that, but you can't, you can't start with junk and then make something good. So, your reposado is your your next one. Now you're adding age on it. So what, how how long are you aging your uh, your reposado? I know there's minimums and stuff, but how long are you doing? Nine months. Nine months okay. in a white oak barrel. In white oak. I know you're using ex bourbon or uh, are you using ex bourbon barrels. Yes, we are. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna yeah, ask. Um, I'm gonna ask a bad question. Do 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 you know where they're coming from? No, they they're, they're used. They're just yeah. yeah they're just used, so, uh, uh, brokered. Yeah. Yeah. Which well, nothing wrong with that. No, the, I experimented with several barrels. This is worth talking about. Too. Okay. So, um, part of the time when I was down there, I experimented like with a, sh like a used sherry cask, mm -hmm. um, and, and bourbon and green barrels too. I tried green barrels. My goal, my goal with the barrel was to find one that didn't take over the agave. So a reposado, like, like we've been talking about, should taste like the Blancos is as pure and clean as you're going to get. Right. And the rep and the reposado shouldn't cover that up. It's one of the reasons why we don't make it in Yeho because over nine months in a barrel, you lose a lot. I would say 50% of what the agave actually tastes like. And, and it's I that's taking over by the wood in the barrel. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we really want to keep the agave pure. Okay. It's a nine-year-old agave. I'm trying mm -hmm. not to ruin it. So that it's, it's, it is the reason we don't have it in Yeho is because I haven't figured out how to make it in Yeho without, getting an overpowered barrel and losing the agave. Um, so the repo, the nine months in a whiskey barrel was as close as I can get where you could still experience the agave the way it's meant to be right out of the ground. 
Um, I, I don't know if that answers your question, yeah, but that's that's absolutely. why we chose to use um, used whiskey barrels, white oak barrels, um, because it didn't get a lot of flavor from it, but it but it gave it that time to rest in the barrel enough for the sugar. Are you, sugar I, I meant to ask you on the Blanco, are you are you resting that at all in stainless yeah. steel or anything like that? No. So you're just basically going right for bottling, right in the bottle. That's great. Yeah. All right. All right. So now you got nine months in a uh, used bourbon barrel. Okay. We start. We start tasting the effects of that. Now you're getting vanillins. You're getting a little bit of that toffee. You're getting some of that stuff in there, yep. but it by no means is overwhelming the underneath flavor. You're still getting that freshness um, with this too. Um, so it's sort of cool because you're getting these, like these overtones of these other flavors. And you're and, and here's the thing that I always that always got got me when people are using like uh, uh, flavorings and stuff like that, like that birthday cake and stuff like that. You can get enough of those flavors occurring naturally when you're using used barrels, bourbon barrels. Yep. You can you're gonna get those you're gonna get those flavors. You don't have to enhance them anymore. Yeah. Because unless you're trying to cover up the bad tequila underneath. Yeah. Well, that's why you're adding additives is right. to, to try and I mean the whole goal with additives is to get to the flavor of a real agave. I mean that's the goal. Which I mean you guys, you guys. But now you're tasting. It. But now you're tasting like you're getting those vanillins. Mm -hmm. You're getting some of that stuff. What do you guys think of this one? Do you guys try the Repsol? You try it. Yes. Yeah. So so I like it. I tell people what the Reposado. What you're going like. to make a margarita? No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say those things. Here. This is, um, I just teasing. None of those people actually said that. So agave. So nine year old agave. Let me back this up because we're spending time talking about agave. It's worth it's worth mentioning. Right. Um, and it's part of the reason like where where additives come from so the most mass produced tequilas will use four year old agave okay just to keep up with production that's about the minimum amount of time you yeah can they're do. pumping it out and they have yeah. to do that yeah. i mean there's so yeah, sort of a, a thing you have to you which is all right the difference yep. between a four year old agave and a nine year old agave think of a pineapple it's even called a pina whenever you're getting ready to harvest it when you get the heart so a four-year-old agave is like a super green pineapple you get at the grocery store that's white and stringy and maybe two drops of juice in it. A nine-year-old agave is a super ripe, juicy, like juice flowing out of it, yellow pineapple. It's delicious. That's the difference between a four-year-old and, and a nine-year-old agave. And it's a lot of, the, I mean, it is the reason why you add white sugar to it. So if you use four-year-old agave, and you press whatever juice in there is left, there's not enough sugar content in that agave to actually ferment it into a tequila. So you have to add white sugar to it. So that's where the whole law comes from. You can use 51% agave juice and 49%. You need that sugar. fermentable sugar. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's where that comes from. So with a nine-year-old agave, that's why you don't have to add any sugar to it is because it has that amount of juice and sugar content in it, just like a, like a honey. Does anybody ever use like um, agave syrup in like recipes and your yeah, like, so you stuff like that? So you sort of know like sort of um, the agave syrup itself is if you get good one is 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 basically the same consistency as as like a honey. That's what you're sort of getting. There's a good there's a good test. There's another test that I mean, really, I don't know how you'd see it up here, but um, I would ask for videos. I have I have so many videos on my phone. I love doing it. It's one of my favorite things to do other than showing people how to feel it. Is um, if you want to know you have good agave, whenever you're whenever you're harvesting it after you cook it, they're going to be covered in bees. It's bees, it's so sweet. The, the four year old agave, there's no bees. There's no bees around that. They know better. They're smarter than all of us. Um, so whenever <laughs> so whenever you're sitting there and you're pressing out the agave, if there's bees everywhere, uh, you've got you've done it right. And so I'll ask I'll ask other owners and stuff. I'm like, let me see let me see your process. You know, let's see some pictures of uh, when you're pressing the agave. And, if there's bees in a video, I'm like, that's going to be good. If there's no bees around, or you can ask people too. You're like, you could slide it in there and be like, hey, when you guys are distilling, you guys have a problem with bees? Do you ever get stung when you're down there? And they're like, no, what are you talking about? You probably don't drink it. Don't drink that. Don't tequila. drink that tequila. That tequila is yeah. out. Yeah. Bees love, bees love juicy, ripe agave penis. Oh, that's a good thing. It's good. I mean, it's good. Good. Too. Um, Agave is sweeter than sugar. Super yeah, correct. It's super. You don't need you don't use it a lot when you're doing stuff because you don't need a lot to make something sweet. So that's an, another sort of a point of this. 
All right. So now we have these. What do you guys think? Do you, would you like the, the like the two tequilas? Yeah, it's great, right? So here's the deal: is that supporting this brand, you get two things. I probably get drunk too, so maybe three. So, but we'll go with two for now. You get really good taste in tequila, and you get tequila that you're knowing sort of like what's going into it and what you're not putting into it, mm-hmm. right? And then also part. This this has been designed, and what you're trying to do is to sell this to support the veterans for your program. Yeah, yeah. Well, so you're doing two things: you're helping people, and you get to drink, and you probably get drunk, but not responsibly, at home, and don't what, hurt anybody, and, and, and no driving. It's one of the reasons why I decided on tequila too, is because getting donations for a nonprofit's extremely difficult, really really hard like asking people for money people don't want to give up money yep but everybody's buying booze right it's like one of the only things in the world that didn't go down in the great depression for instance <laughs> so like booze and cosmetics were like right. some of the only things so i was like well if everybody's buying well, if you're booze, anyways, booze you might not need as much cosmetics right yeah there's, there's all right yeah, there you go there you go um so i'm like if everybody's buying booze anyways and we're not getting any donations what if we make one of the best tequilas here right and sell it and give all the money back of- to our nonprofits. I mean, I think that's part, like you, you probably should go through this a little bit. Like er, you're doing this program, but sailing is not a cheap venture. It's not at all. No. All right. You wreck us. Like you told me this earlier, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to bait you up. You wreck a sale. How much does the new sale cost? Yeah. But you, you blow out a sale. Um, you get hit by a random gust while you're at sea and the sale just splits open. It's $12,000 for a new sale. Um, it's like buying a car, buying a, buying a new main sale is $16,000. Um, and then all the sailing gear each person needs, you know, you know harnesses, personal Jeep. Everybody has a GPS on them at all times. Um, tethers, sleeping gear, and then Fowley's foul weather gear for whenever you're in freezing waters and stuff it gets, it all, it's all, it's a very pricey sport. Um, and again, but the another, reward is what you're going for. Yeah, the man, reward see, of this. You get to see things that you would never see in your life just under a, in the middle of the night with a group of three other people who've been through it, you've been through overseas. And then you're under a sky full of stars watching meteor showers fly over you, with dolphins jumping next to you. Like that, those moments remind you that the world is good. And um, besides all the science behind how sailing actually works, um, and being in those environments work like just just being reminded that the world's beautiful again. That saved me. And before I even knew about the science, that's why that's why I wanted to make a sailing nonprofit because sailing turned my life around. It made me it made me want to stay alive to see the next day. It made me want to stay alive in a storm to see the sunrise whenever the storm was over. Um, and I wanted my buddies to be able to experience that. And still do. And that's, that's why we do what we do just to, just to offer those guys that experience. Cause a lot of guys come out and women um, as well, probably equally amount um, come out and, you know, you get real depressed. Like depression is, it's a trap. It's a dark hole that, I mean, I couldn't dig out of it on myself. It it shows up too. Right. And And it it just keeps coming around. Yeah. And then it gets worse and worse and worse and spirals and putting somebody in an environment where the world's beautiful again, kind of just slaps you right out of that. And uh, reminds you that you don't have to live like that. You don't have to live in darkness every single day. Um, And being at sea, it's a powerful thing. It doesn't give you an option. You don't have a choice. Like when you're at home, I remember whenever I was, when I was that bad, um, people would offer to help me. And I was like, no, like piss off. I'm going to sit here and and just wallow in my own misery. And this is what I want. I want to, I want to hurt. I want to feel this. Um, and being at sea doesn't give you a choice. Like if you're on shift, like it's your four hour shift and you got to let your other crew sleep, you have no other choice, but to sit up there and watch that purple sunrise come over the horizon and all these birds coming around to the boat and be like, nobody, no sane person can look at a moment like that and be like, that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen. You know, that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. It's those moments that uh that stay with you, stay with me, and and that's why it really. But it's also that me. whole thing is that you're working as a team, and you started not going to let anybody else down too. Yeah, so I think I think that's kind of the like 
I don't want to say I cracked the code here, but veterans and military people in the military are super stubborn and like will never take care of themselves ever. Right. They don't care but about they won't, themselves. They won't let anybody else die. Yeah, but I'm not like I'm not gonna let Michael die. I don't care if like if I want to die, I don't want anything to happen to him, you know. I right. don't want anybody to happen next to me. And right. so like I said, when you're on the boat, you don't have an option but but to care. Um so that's probably really the really thing. powerful thing. It, it is. really is. Yeah, which is why we decided to get into one of the hardest industries in the world. Yeah, you know what they usually say? You want to make a little money in the liquor industry? You start with a lot. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, but but again, but your reasoning behind it is sound. Um, the, the biggest thing that I, the, the hurdle that you have w- with this is to get everybody else that's watching uh, on us on here, that's here with us today. And we got like 30 something people here with us today. Um, and people that are watching us on Facebook and stuff like that is they have to drink the tequila too. Yeah, you I'm not going to say drinking the Kool-Aid. You got to drink the tequila too. It, it's one of those type of things. You need them to sort of spread the word of what you're doing. You can't be here like every day, like in all the stores and, and restaurants and bars and saying, hey, you got to take our tequila is really good, really good. You, you got to have them going out. Hey, if you're going to buy tequila, it's no more expensive than anybody else's. It's better tequila than everybody else, you know, that, that most of the tequilas you're going to find out there. That might have been me. I don't know. Um, but you but you have to they have to be like your ambassadors. And that's what you need is more people saying like this is I can I can buy tequila and have a good time. And I'm also helping some veterans out um, to, to, you know, to, to go through this, because what what do you like? If you're a veteran coming on to this, what do you have to bring with you? How much does it cost for the it, veteran? Nothing. Right. So we get to supply everything for that veteran to get better. And that sort of whole feeling thing is they're going to come out on the other side of this. Hopefully, that's the that's the goal, yep. is hopefully come out on, on the other side of this and then just they're going to help somebody else. Yeah, definitely. And it's they that. help somebody else and they help somebody Every else time. and that's the whole thing. And that's the, that's the that's the 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 ultimate goal, is to have everybody else. I I, I this is, I'm gonna go watch the movie. I haven't watched the movie. You should. It's even better when you watch it while you drink tequila too. When you drink lots of tequila, you want tequila. <laughs> Good. And and uh, we'll watch the movie. All right. I want to thank you very much for coming and sharing with us tonight. I really appreciate. I thank you, that. man. You guys have, you guys have been really nice. Really, really great. great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Basad, of putting that in there. Uh, listen, um, thank you, everybody that's that's watching us on on Facebook. And if you want to go see it again, go to It's the Liquor Talking, and you can see this again. You tell your friends about it. Tell them to come watch uh, watch t- uh, Taylor um, and learn about this. Go watch the movie and stuff like that. Um, we tried some great tequila. That's the only thing you're missing at home. You really should have been here. It was awesome. Um, but we'll, 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 we won't hold that against you as long as you go out and buy some of the Cape Horn tequila. How's that? All right. Thank you, everybody. And we're going to stop.